Well, good morning, Net Community. To everyone online, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our very first live stream here at Net Community. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had people ask, hey, hey, when are you guys going to start streaming online? And, and uh, we would love to watch it from Chicago or from Texas or wherever people find themselves. So there's one good thing from the COVID-19. Here we are. We are live streaming um, our service from Net Community Church. Um, I'm solo today. There is no worship team, obviously. Um, trying to honor the less than 10 requirement that our governor put out uh, last week. So, um, you know, just a word as, as I welcome you all. Without a doubt, uh, Satan is trying to keep the church from being able to move forward with the gospel message. And you know, as I was praying this morning and thinking about this service, I, I couldn't help but think about just how many more people we're going to be able to reach through this thing they call the internet and through this platform we call Facebook. And by the way, it's also uh, streaming live currently on our website as well. If you have friends out there that don't have Facebook, let them know that they can go to www.netcommunity.org. And uh, it is on our homepage right there. When they, when they click on, on that link, it'll, it should come up and uh, they'll be able to watch this Facebook live stream without a Facebook account. Uh, give us a little bit of grace. This is our first week, so we're hopeful that, that that side of it works as well. So the next thing I have is um, a little bit of logistical. So in these times, we're not able to come together and, and uh, meet physically and see each other. Um, how, do we, how do we connect? Well, I want to... Uh, Talk about connecting first and foremost in prayer. I feel that is the most important thing in the life of a Christ follower, to be able to communicate with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and the Father. So that being said, uh, obviously we're not going to have communication cards today uh, passed throughout the sanctuary, but there are a couple different ways you can see it up on the screen right now. First, you can text or call your prayer request into 618-977-4441. And that will be uh, delivered directly to um, your pastoral staff. Uh, the next way is by sending an email, a brand new email group we set up called prayer at netcommunity.org. Feel free to uh, send an email to that link as well. Um, that is something we take very seriously here at Net Community is being able to pray for you folks through this time as well. And listen, would you do me a favor and pray for your pastoral team? Uh, you know, these times, I've seen a lot of posts out there about it. They're interesting times, right? Um, this is my first time pastoring through COVID-19. I'm a, I'm a fairly new pastor, relatively speaking, uh, five years in, in the business, so to speak. However, I know that there are pastors out there that have been preaching for 30, 40, 50 years that haven't experienced this either. So would you lift us all up in prayer as, as you're um, uh, praying this week for the needs of our community, the needs of your family, uh, and the needs of your church? Uh, and secondly, you should have received an email just a few moments ago. It's also on our Facebook page about how to download the, the uh, sermon fill-in-the-blanks today. We're going to try to continue to keep this as normal as we can. Um, we have an app out there, the church app that we talk about regularly that's posted on our, our, uh, our weekly sermons that you can go to and listen. Um, and and there's, a, there's a link and, and everything attached to that email or on that Facebook post where you can go out and get the fill-in-the-blanks and, um, and continue to work through that app um, and the outline as I give the fill in, in the blanks today. So <clears throat> if you're like me, you know, you're, you're searching, you're, you're looking, you're praying. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute to, to offer up a little bit of, uh, of peace and hope. And there's no better way to find that than in Scripture. So 
Just a couple of uh, reminders from the Lord this morning before we jump into our, our regular series and continue on in the book of Genesis. Um, in John 16, he says this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Can, can, you, can I get an amen on that from home? I think we are seeing tribulation. But then what? But take heart. I have overcome the world. My friends, this did not surprise the Lord in the least. And he's telling us, look, calm down. I've already overcome the world. I already died for you and the sins of your fellow man. And with me in your corner, there's not one person that could ever be against you. Psalm 85, 8 reminds us, let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. So in these times, we may be tempted to go back to maybe our old addictions. The stress is overwhelming, right? We may be tempted to pick up that bottle or to click that button that takes us to a place online that we're not supposed to go. The Lord is saying, look, turn to me. I'm still here. I haven't changed. Nothing, nothing, nothing has changed. I'm still the same God as I was before COVID-19, and I will be the same God after COVID-19. Take heart, my friends. He is our refuge and our strength through this turbulence. Then the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, he says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what's he saying there? First, he talks about prayer, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Do you have a thankful heart this morning? I hope so. More than likely, you're watching this from your home. It's sleeting outside right now. What's up with that? And it's supposed to be 67 by Wednesday. But with prayer and thanksgiving, be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for that Bible sitting in your lap and that cup of coffee or that glass of water or that cup of orange juice or those eggs you're eating this morning while you're watching have been given to you. And then he says that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, which will absolutely blow your mind. Something that you will not understand. I will give to you. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this morning, we're going to continue on in in our New Beginning series. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 10, so... Now would be that time to get out your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 through 32, which is the whole chapter. And I know we have a a lot of guests out there, so I'm going to go through some some routines here that I know will be very common for you that, that attend that community on a regular basis. But each week we have what we call the the big idea. So I always tell folks, if there's nothing more that you hear today and you end up falling asleep after this, which now you're at home, you can fall asleep and I I can't hold you accountable, right? Oh, but the Lord knows. (laughs) Um, this This is one of the most important things today. The message is entitled, The Table of Nations, and the big idea is this, divided nations rise up out of human pride and fall at the hands of the Lord's judgment. Again, as I prepared this message, many of you know, but many of you may not know, since I am bivocational, I try to write my messages two weeks in advance to try to stay ahead of the curve. And so when this message was written approximately two weeks ago, we were not quarantined. I fully plan to be able to deliver this to you live here at the church. But then as I look back this week and I read the big idea once again, it hit me. Divided nations rise up out of human pride and fall at the hands of the Lord's judgment. See, my friends, right now I feel that our our nation is, is being divided by this virus. 
I feel that many are trying to use this as a political platform. And the Lord is reminding us, look, your pride and arrogance comes at a cost. The judgment that will come to your nation is real. And my friends, I feel right now that that's a little bit of what we're seeing. A little bit of, hey, America, the world, the entire earth, wake up. I mean business. Obviously, we know that the Lord is sovereign and in control of all things. So, yes, he was aware that this was coming. Yes, he allowed this to happen. But the most important thing is, how do we respond? See, that's what the Lord is looking at right now. How do you personally respond? Are you going to continue to divide this nation? out of human pride and selfishness? And he says, if so, this nation will fall at the hands of the Lord's judgment. So this is the 11th message in our series entitled New Beginning. So back on January 1, we we started this series, and we we knew back then that many were focusing on their new beginnings and and the the New Year's resolutions and those types of things. So... um, What does God's word here say about the beginning of time and and how did we end up where we are today? Was was the purpose of this series being taught from the book of Genesis? So here at Net Community, we preach in an expository fashion. So what that means today is I'm going to take that block of verses 1 through 32 in Genesis chapter 10 and I'm going to break them down to help us to seek to understand. See, the Lord also has a little bit of sense of humor. Maybe you read ahead and, and maybe you're looking through it right now. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, Derek has got his work cut out for him with these names. Oh, yes, I do. For the entire world to see today. So uh, I'm going to do my best with these names. But we all know that they're very important. And we don't skip past the hard stuff here at Net Community. So what's the context or the background of, of Genesis here? So the word Genesis in Hebrew means in the beginning. So I know we're, we're very creative here at Net with the title of this series. So Genesis is the first book out of the five that Moses uh, had, had written called the Pentateuch. Moses wrote the Pentateuch sometime during the 40 years he was a leader of the Israelites. So it was potentially written somewhere around the mid to latter part of the 15th century B.C. So you say, that's great. Who was Moses? So for those of you that attended NET last year, do you remember our, our series that we had, Exit Left and, and Swipe Right? As we walk through the book of Exodus and and we watch this awesome leader, Moses, who was also doubtful at times, right? Lead the Israelites into the promised land. See, he was a Hebrew slave that through many circumstances only God could orchestrate, was raised by the daughter of the Pharaoh, the baby in the basket, right? And he's, he's sent down the river and he's picked up by the daughter of the Pharaoh. A circumstance that we know only God could have orchestrated, He was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians during his time living with the Pharaoh. So he was able to know the lifestyle and the culture of the Egyptians. And guess what? He used that to his advantage for the Lord. So he continued to lead Israel for the 40 years in the wilderness experience. So Genesis was written in a world that was full of polytheism, meaning more than one God. Genesis here speaks clearly to that teaching that only one God exists, and He is Lord over all creation. In the book of Genesis, you will find the creation story, the fall of mankind, the flood, the call of Abraham, and the beginning of the patriarchs. It's a book that demonstrates God's mercy and God's judgment. God's mercy and God's judgment. Each week we see a little bit of that, right, as we walk through this scripture. Let's pray. Father God, as we open your word today, things look much different. People are crying out for hope. People are lost and turning back to their old addictions. People are forgetting who you say you are. Lord, we know that that's natural. Our flesh is fearful. But we know for Christ followers, those that have professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. 
Father, we pray from this moment forward that the Spirit takes over. That the Spirit would guide and direct our mind and our thoughts, not just in this 30 to 45 minutes that we have together today, but as we end today, that we would remember this week that you're still on the throne. And that this does not surprise you. Father, those out there that have put their faith and trust in earthly possessions are being rocked to the core. That fast new car is now parked in the garage. That wonderful job that pays our bills may or may not still be there. All of the things that we put our trust in, money, the health care system, our own health, is being shaken. But Lord, we know that you tell us that as a believer, if we build our life on the rock, that when the storms prevail, we will not be shaken. Father, I pray that everybody out there watching today has done that, that they have given their life to Jesus and they are standing on the promises of the Word of God this morning. And that those that have built on shifting and sifting sand would wake up and realize that this is just the beginning of the storm, just the beginning of this coronavirus that we're facing, and that it's never too late to begin to construct on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Father, be with us now. Open our ears, hearts, and minds to hear a fresh word from you. Be with me as your mouthpiece this morning to deliver that hope that your people are so desperately wanting. Father, I give you all the praise and glory for the media team that's worked so hard to, to set this up here at Net Community. Father, we just pray that we haven't labored in vain. Assure us this morning, reach your people and speak. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, kind of as a way of introduction this morning as we jump into the Scripture, we've, we have seen the Genesis, uh, that in the book of Genesis, all of the new beginnings, right? We've seen the creation of the universe and the creation of man. We've seen the fall of, of Adam and Eve who sinned and were removed from the garden. We've seen the wickedness of man increase as man multiplied and things just got worse and worse. Then we've seen the judgment of God with the flood of Noah. And now today, we see the world beginning all over again with Noah's family. The purpose of the listing of names we're getting ready to go through here this morning is is to trace the origin of these groups, not to name every single descendant of Noah. So as you get caught up in the names, remember the purpose. The purpose that we have for listing these names here this morning is, is to trace the origin of these groups. And to see where it all began with Noah's family. Would you open your Bible with me now and we're going to read verses 1 through 14. They will also be on the screen for you now here uh, right next to me. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, and Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach and Tyrus, the sons of Gomer, Ashakan, Az, Ripath, and Togarmah, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans and their nations. So they're spreading out. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Sab, Sabta, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Calneh. 
in the land of Shinar. Shinar, sorry, Shinar. Shinar, if I can say it. Shinar, there we go, got it. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. Rehoboth, Ur, Kalah, and Resin, between Nineveh and Kalah, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Leabim, Neph to him, Path Ruzim, Cas Luhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaf or Kaf Kaftorim. Canaan fathered Sidion, his firstborn, and Heth. Let me hit pause there because I said through 14 I was really trying to key in on those words. So again, um, so let's go back up to the top and kind of break this down. Again, the names are important, so we don't want to pass over those. Um, so those of you that got a kick out of that, uh, it, it was, it was uh, just as difficult on my end, trust me. Uh, so here in verse 1, we see Genesis 10 contains what is known as the table of nations. It shows how the, how, how the nations of the world came from the three sons of Noah. That's what it's showing us here. So we might be tempted to just skip through these, right? And, and these names, and I know that as some of us work through reading the Bible through the year and such, this might be the page where you, right? And I can't say those, so I'm just skipping past that. But we can't do that because some of these names, if not all of them, all of them are important because they're here, right? Are quite important. This is sort of a key here to unlocking many of the things in the Bible. See, the more names you learn to identify in this chapter, the more you will understand the key players in the Bible. I'm sure some of those, like Meshach, right, probably rang a bell. Abednego, does that ring a bell at all with you? So in all probability, it was Shem that that kept this record from what I found. His lineage is is given the fullest, as though he lost track of the other lines due to their dispersion. So Shem is also listed as an author in chapter 11, verse 10. See, there are 70 nations here listed in all. 14 from Japheth, 30 from Ham, and 26 from Shem quite complicated, isn't it? <clears throat> so in verse 2, we see Japheth here basically becomes the father of the European nations. Do you see that? See, these are the same nations listed among those who will attack Israel in the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapters 38 and 39. So let's look down now to verse 8. So in verses 8 through 14, some of these places... Nimrod settled would be, become world empires, right? So these are the beginnings of world empires. Babel, right, is a Hebrew word. The Greek form is what? Babylon. Nineveh, we know about Nineveh, right, would be the capital of the Assyrian Empire. So it's not surprising that, that Nimrod becomes a little g god in the Babylonian religions. He's, per, he's a pretty important dude, right? But he is not God himself. So it gives you a taste of this man's pride and how he would be puffed up, right? And he will drive things to come as we continue through this series next week at the Tower of Babel. First fill in the blank this morning is this. Intricate details are many times the key to unlocking many interrelated important facts throughout the 66 books of the Bible. And Matt, leave that up there for a little bit. Um, Intricate details are many times the key to unlocking many interrelated important facts throughout the 66 books of the Bible. See, these little intricate details, we've talked about this many times on Sunday mornings. If it's in the Word of God, it's important. It's not something that we're supposed to just skip past because we don't understand. I encourage all of you to do your research, to stop, pause if you don't understand something as you read the Word and begin to dig and begin to research. This thing that we're streaming on today called the Internet is filled with great knowledge. But again, watch your sources. You want to make sure that you're keying in on sources that are known and not listening to false 
Gospels. All right, let's pick back up in 15 through 20. <clears throat> so Canaan fathered Sidion, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemarites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebulon, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Continuing on through verse 32, correction, stopping there, stopping there for a moment. So let's talk about what we just read. In verse 15, so we see the name Heth here. Heth is, is where the, the, the Hittites come from. Verse 16, the names of these descendants are familiar if you've read through the book of Exodus and Joshua. These are the Canaanites. And in verses 17 through 19, if you remember last week, we talked about the sexual nature of sin of Ham, right? And, and, the, and the resultant curse on the Canaanites. You remember when Ham saw his father Noah naked, correct? I won't get into that story because I know we have some of our net kids watching as well. But those of you who are here probably remember that. And if you don't, go back to chapter 9 and, and look it up. You'll see what I'm talking about. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the, that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that we see later on here in Genesis in chapters 18 and 19, places known for their depravity, right, come from Canaan. See, the curse of sexual sin rules over families for generations currently in our world, passed down from one generation to another. My guess is if this exists in your family, you're probably not the first one to experience it. It's passed down from generation to generation. Then here in verse 20, we see these are all the sons of Ham, so we should continue to watch for them throughout the rest of the Bible. Always cross-referencing when a name is mentioned. Which tribe are they from? What's their lineage? And what are the issues they struggle with? See, all this contextual background and data is so important for us, otherwise it just becomes a name or a word on a page. We have to dig in when we're reading the Word of God. These folks are no different than you or I in our present day. That's why it's important to know. They're no less sinful than you and I. They're no less in need of a Savior than you and I. Second fill in the blank. Our sin is passed down from generation to generation until someone decides to be the change agent working in harmony with Christ. So let me just ask you, are, are you that change agent? Are you that change agent? At some point in time, we have to put the brakes on and change the course for our families. Maybe that's you. Maybe as you sit there this morning, you think about how you were raised and maybe some of the missteps your parents or grandparents might have had that, wow, you see have trickled over into your own family? Are you the one that's to be the change agent? Are you the one that's to give your life to Jesus Christ and stop Satan in his tracks? The curse will continue to be passed down from generation to generation otherwise. At some point, somebody has to pump the brakes. Now 21 through 32. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. 
Arpachshad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. For in this day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almodad, Shelef, Hazar Mavith, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obo, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab, Jobab. All these were the sons of Yoktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Misha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies and their nations. And from these, a nation spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Get a drink here. So, now let's kind of look at this chunk of verses collectively together. A mysterious note that I made is, is attached to the name of Peleg here in verse 25. See, Peleg's name in Hebrew means divided. That in his days, the earth was divided. So most likely this refers to the dividing of the nations at Babel, which we'll get into next week. So chronologically, Genesis 11 for next week fits in here, which may be during Nimrod's time, three or four generations after the flood is what we're seeing here. If Nimrod built Babylon, then God could have scattered the nations in his time, right? After which he moved north to conquer Nineveh. Some have suggested that this division of the earth is a, a reference to the continental drift. The idea that, that the continents were once together in one great landmass, but have since drifted apart. There is scientific evidence to support that theory, although most would date it far earlier than this. But even in the last century, before scientists advanced that idea, some suggested this theory. It's interesting that, that in Greek, the word for sea is pelagos, which we get archipelago from this. Another large word. So if there was a catastrophic upheaval in Peleg's day, in which the continents moved apart and the seas broke in one, scattering the lands, both the Greek and the Hebrew, meaning of Peleg's name, would make perfect sense. Would you agree with that? So with that as an overview of these verses, what can we learn? I felt that this was um, somewhat confusing, so I wanted to try to help us understand in, in a in a numbering system kind of way. And, and these aren't necessarily numbered in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in of importance, um, except for number one. The three lessons that I think we need to learn from this, number one, people are quick to forget God. Boy, is that message right on time? Again, when I wrote this, who would have thought that we would be where we're at today? People are quick to forget God in their times of struggle. When the sun is shining and, 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 the, and the spring air is, is great and the flowers are blooming and things are well, the birds are chirping. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. He's awesome. COVID-19 strikes. Stock market crashes. People are turning back to their old ways. Domestic violence is through the roof. People are locking and loading, buying guns and ammunition at an alarming rate. Everybody is panicking. Have we forgotten? We're so quick to forget God. Even some of the strongest Christ followers, some of the strongest theologians of the day have dealt with that same struggle. God, where were you when? And we know based on his scripture, he is present. So both, both here in verses 1 and at the beginning and towards the end here at, at 32, 
We see the phrase used, after the flood. Why do I bring that up? You would think that a judgment as catastrophic as the flood was cause people to fear God for many generations after. To respect Him, to trust Him. He showed them something amazing. We talked about it last week. His word and His promises never return void. See, they should have realized that they could not defy God with impunity. And yet here, we have a table of nations with no hint that any of them followed the one true God. It's overwhelming to think of of all these names and to realize that, that they represent whole groups of people, whole nations who lived and died for the most part without God. Do you see that this morning? I hope there was, there was more knowledge of God than, than we are aware of here. That's simply not mentioned. But, but what we know of these nations from, from latter history would not indicate that any of them ever came to worship the one true God. Number two, people are quick to forget the oneness of the human race. There is one true and living God. There is also one human race which He created in His image. We all are descended from the same family. My friends, let's start acting like it. Let's stop looking at culture, creed, race, nation, and let's all come together in unity for the greater good of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus came for all and died for all. And that if one confesses with his mouth, that he believes in the Son of God and asks for repentance and, and turns away, that he shall be saved. And repents of his sinful ways, turning away from his sin and his self. The Bible doesn't say that he, he might be saved and that if he does enough works and he's religious enough that he could be saved, it says he shall be saved. Not based on our works, but based on the works of Jesus Christ on the cross. That if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. We are all one in this human race. Number three, God wants all people to hear of his one means of salvation. Without a doubt, my friends, in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My friends, without Jesus, I have one simple question for you this morning. How do you get around that verse? How do you get around that verse? He makes it very clear to us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. Yes, that means us, that means you. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we know that when we perish from this earth and we stand before the Father in judgment, which all of us will, He's telling you, you don't get in without me. You don't get to come through the pearly gates without Jesus. And Acts 4.12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Again, for those that put their faith and trust in any other type of little g God, I simply don't know how you get around that verse. Jesus Christ and His sacrificial death on the cross is God's one means of salvation, my friends. He wants all to hear the name of Jesus. Going back to number three, God wants all people to hear His one means of salvation. You know, I think back to my friend Eddie Pollen and, and um, at one time our, our church planting director, Van Kicklider, who made this very profound statement he said, you know, it's very hard to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in the state of Illinois. For those of you watching in Illinois, that rings true for us. 
Think about that. When is the last time you saw mention anywhere outside of the four walls of church or in your home of Jesus Christ? Do you see billboards with it on there? Very rarely. Do you see people talking about it at the market? Very rarely. It's extremely hard to hear the good news of Jesus Christ in the state of Illinois. I'm just going to tag on to what Van said in the United States of America. My last fill in the blank is, a nation divided will always struggle to see the movement of the Lord. A nation divided will always struggle to see the movement of the Lord. Are you struggling to see His movement today? Are we as a nation struggling to see His movement very sad that our Lord has to battle so hard to break through, but we know He will, and we know He does. Those of you that have received salvation in Jesus Christ, He broke through for you. He made it. He finally reached you, and we need to praise God for that. That wraps up our, <clears throat> our Scripture message today. In this time of response and what we would normally do here at, at Net Community is, is just this. In these moments that follow, I'm going to go over some announcements. But my guess is, even through technology, God has called some folks to repentance, to make some decisions for Him. Just because we're on technology, I, I heard from um, one of our fellow church planters, Mike Whittemore. He posted a uh, shout out to Mike down in Belleville. Somebody was saved on a Zoom call yesterday. God is using technology. And this person that was saved was, quote, a Christ follower, but found himself in a wreck and realized that he was missing the key. Jesus Christ. He was striving to work. He was striving to serve. He was hiding sin from people. He wasn't who he really was portrayed to folks that he was and God brought him to his knees and he received Jesus Christ on that Zoom call so we praise God for that one salvation in Belleville yesterday let's pray Father as we close this message today I, I'm grateful that you took the awkwardness of this away that you allowed me to speak in essence to the camera and not an empty room I'm grateful that the folks that have logged on here to watch today took the time when they, they quite frankly could have been doing anything else to hear from you. Lord, we need you now more than ever. We need to stay connected with one another. Help us to do just that. Seeing each other's faces through various means, FaceTime, chat rooms, etc. need to be utilized. We need to encourage one another. And we need to continue with those random acts of kindness. As we find ourselves maybe at the grocery store, in the drive through line at a local restaurant, help us to continue to find ways to be the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, we desire to be your great witnesses in this time of great trouble. Lord, help us to realize that when we put our faith and trust in things of this world, in a matter of a moment, a matter of seconds with this virus infiltrating people. That's gone. The only hope is in you, Jesus. We're grateful for the reminder of that through this virus. We're grateful for the extra time spent at home with our families. We're grateful for maybe those dinner table conversations and eating together moments coming back once again. Thank you for slowing our nation down. Lord, we so needed it. We pray for all those this morning. I think of my brother and my fellow pastor, Tim Lewis, down at Bethel, Baptist in Troy, Illinois, that, that traveled over to the Ukraine to, to serve, serve you, God, in mission and contracted COVID-19. So happy to hear his update this morning that he is doing well that you've protected him. Yes, he was a little ill, 
but help him in these moments of quarantine when he feels all alone to feel your presence right there in his home. Help us all to be obedient to the restrictions that have been placed upon us by our local authorities and our governments. Father, you call us to obey in your word. We may not agree. We may not understand. But we're called to obey. Help us to do just that. And Father, I pray that if anyone out there this morning desires to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would simply email prayers at netcommunity.com or maybe comment now on Facebook and a pastor will follow up with them. And those that need to rededicate their lives or plug back into ministry in a church once again, that they would do just that. Now is not the time for us to lay up, God. You've reminded us of that. You remind us that the Great Commission doesn't stop. And we are continue to march forward, sharing the gospel and making disciples as you've instructed us. And once we come back together, baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. All right, um, <clears throat> moving forward in our words of announcements here. Um, I want to throw that prayer slide back up there again for, for everyone to, to look at. Um, please write down that phone number or that email address and send us your, your prayer requests um, uh, via those two avenues. Um, Next, you might say, well, okay, so now is the time when we generally collect our offering. How, how do we do that? Well, my friends, a sad reality in, in America is this. If you're not present, many feel that they don't need to give. Well, guess what? If we're in this state of isolation for an extended period of time, um, I don't know how the church will continue to operate. We rely upon your faithful giving. And so, if you would like to continue to, to give, there are two different methods you can do. One, by texting to the, to the uh, phone number right there on the screen, 312-278-3716. Online at www.netcommunity.org. So, I'm sorry, there are three, three ways here. And lastly, the good old-fashioned snail mail. Mail your check to P.O. Box 5. Staunton, Illinois, 62088. Now, that feels weird. That feels like I'm some sort of a televangelist. That's weird. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Next slide is we're obviously not going to be executing our plans to go to two services as we originally had planned. Times have changed, right? We can't even have one service right, right now, let alone two. But we know... The, the trajectory or the, the statistics out there right now are showing that when we are able to come back collectively as a church, the churches will explode. That people will be so happy to get back collectively together as the church, collectively together in one body, that attendance is expected to explode. So I have no doubt, my friends, that we'll be right back to that two-service conversation once we're able to collectively gather together again. But when we are able to come back together, we will begin to meet at 9.30. Our online streaming will be at 9.30. And so, such a reminder each week to log on. We will do just like we did this week, each and every week. We'll be live beginning at 9.25. Well, that's all I have this morning, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us. I do pray that the Lord moved and spoke to you and again, reach out if you have prayer needs or requests. We're here for you. We love you. We're praying for this entire nation and your prayer requests specifically. Have a great week, and we'll see you back online next week at 930.